Excellences, <coughs> judges, ladies and gentlemen, as president of the mechanism for international criminal tribunals, I am delighted and honored to welcome all of you here today as we mark the commencement of the mechanism's first branch. I am particularly grateful that we are joined here today by representatives from the Office of the United Nations Legal Affairs, the Republic of Tanzania, the Republic of Rwanda, my fellow principals of the mechanism, Prosecutor Jallo and Registrar Hawking, as well as by the President of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda and Officer in Charge of the Judicial and Legal Services Division on behalf of the Registrar of the ICTR. Our program will begin with a statement by Mr. Stephen Matthias, the Assistant Secretary General for Legal Affairs, who will be addressing us on behalf of the Secretary General of the United Nations and the Under Secretary General for Legal Affairs, the Legal Council. Mr. Matthias, I invite you to take the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. President, judges, prosecutor, registrar, colleagues. It is a great pleasure to be here today to extend to you the good wishes of the Secretary General of the United Nations and the Legal Council, and on their behalf to witness together with you the commencement of the functioning of the International Residual Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals. It would be remiss of me not to begin by thanking our hosts. I am referring here not only to all of you who have put such effort into organizing today's important occasion, but also to the government of Tanzania for its excellent cooperative approach to hosting the ICTR and now also this mechanism. I would like in particular to thank the government for generously agreeing to provide land in Arusha on which a suitable building can be constructed to house this mechanism. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the government of Rwanda for its continuing cooperation throughout the life of the ICTR and its increasing role now that it has begun the important task of receiving cases referred by the ICTR to its national courts. This is a most important development, not only for Rwanda itself in addressing the horrendous crimes that took place in 1994, but also for the ICTR as it strives to complete its mandate. It may sound like a cliche to say that the commencement of this mechanism is a historic moment, but it is truly nothing less than that. There has been an international discussion and debate for a decade or more on what it should look like, on what its functions should be. It is the people in this room that have answered that question. And I'm very proud of the dedication, hard work, and team effort that has gone into making it a reality. I am sure that UN headquarters can feel very remote from your work here and in The Hague on a day-to-day -day basis. This is an opportunity for me to tell you face to face on behalf of the Secretary General and the Legal Council just how much we value your hard work and appreciate the dedication with which you are doing it. The world was shocked at the extent of the slaughter that took place in the 1990s in the former Yugoslavia and the genocide in 1994 in Rwanda. No one can fail to understand the absolutely essential nature of the work of the ICTR and the ICTY in insisting that accountability for these shocking crimes be observed. Ending impunity for serious international crimes is one of the Secretary General's key priorities. He follows the work of the ICTR and ICTY very closely, and he is personally committed to doing everything possible to encourage and support the work of all the UN-assisted tribunals. 
This support and encouragement will continue, of course, as the ICTR and the ICTY complete their mandates and as this mechanism begins its essential role in continuing their functions and ensuring their legacy. No one anticipated in 1993 and 1994 that the ICTY and the ICTR would still be with us in 2012. This persistence and determination sends a powerful message on behalf of the international community that impunity will not be tolerated. Through their nearly 20 years, the tribunals have achieved remarkable successes. They have demonstrated that international criminal tribunals can deliver significant numbers of trials of the most complex international crimes in accordance with international standards of fairness. The tribunals have pushed international expectations of accountability beyond what had been anticipated in 1993 and 1994. Their establishment and success undoubtedly contributed to the successful negotiation of the Rome Statute and the establishment of the International Criminal Court. The trials before the two tribunals have generated a huge corpus of jurisprudence, which has contributed extensively to the development of international criminal law, both substantive and procedural. The judges have defined, often for the first time, the elements of the most serious international crimes, the impact of defenses raised, and the scope of superior responsibility. Scholars have also recognized the important role of the tribunals in the realm of gender crimes, an area left largely undeveloped in the Nuremberg and Tokyo proceedings. Cases before the ICTR have involved a former prime minister and several ministers, prefects, and other leaders who would otherwise not have been brought to justice. The ICTR has delivered groundbreaking judgments concerning genocide, such as Akayesu, the first case in which an international tribunal was called upon to interpret the definition of genocide and in which it established that rape and sexual violence may constitute genocide. The extent to which the tribunals have developed a body of procedural law relating to the admissibility and disclosure of evidence, the protection of victims, witnesses, and the accused is sometimes overlooked. The tribunals have drawn on both common law and civil law systems to balance the rights of victims and the accused, to protect the interests of justice, and to enhance the efficiency of proceedings. Also of vital importance is the body of evidence and facts established by the tribunals that serve as an invaluable historical legacy and a sound basis on which the people of Rwanda and of the former Yugoslavia can continue the process of reconciliation and building a peaceful and prosperous future. A further aspect of the commencement of this mechanism that we should all recognize today is its role as a model for other such mechanisms that are or will become necessary. Its innovative design with a mandate to be lean and cost effective is based on a small efficient administrative hub with rosters of judges and other staff that can be drawn upon as judicial and other needs expand and contract. The innovative thinking and planning that has gone into the establishment of this mechanism has already informed the thinking and benefited the negotiation that my office conducted with the government of Sierra Leone for the establishment of a residual special court for Sierra Leone. The necessary agreement has already been concluded and the residual special court will come into operation as soon as the proceedings of the Charles Taylor case are finished. We are also drawing on the experience gained through establishment of this mechanism to inform our thinking about a possible future such mechanism for the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia. The needs are likely to be very different, of course, because unlike the ICTR and the ICTY, the extraordinary uh, chambers in the courts of Cambodia is a national court of Cambodia. Nevertheless, the experience with this mechanism has given us a clear background of knowledge and experience 
and a framework within which to consider what might happen with the ECCC. And the same will be true, no doubt, for the Special Tribunal for Lebanon when the time comes to consider its residual phase. The commencement of this mechanism, therefore, may be the first in a series, very likely sharing similar characteristics. Moreover, if the political organs of the United Nations were to decide in future to establish any further tribunals, I suspect strongly that they would be influenced by the model for this mechanism. They may well wish to emulate its lean and efficient design with a small administrative footprint, the ability to expand and contract as needs dictate, and authority to make referrals to national courts in appropriate cases. Turning now to the role that you are playing in these important developments, I would like to underline that each one of you is playing your part in the critical role of ensuring accountability for the shocking crimes committed in Rwanda and in former Yugoslavia. I am talking here not only about the president and the other principals sitting here next to me and the judges and other senior officials, but each of you, the lawyers, drivers, translators, administrators, security officers, working in partnership with each other and with UN headquarters. You are all individually and collectively responsible for the success of the tribunals, and I am confident that you will continue to ensure a smooth transition to this mechanism. On this visit to Arusha, I have had the opportunity to witness your dedication and professionalism firsthand, and the message that I will be taking back to UN headquarters is the need for us in New York to continue to do everything in our power to support you. I would like to take a moment to highlight the essential assistance that you in the tribunals have given to the Security Council as it did its work in establishing this mechanism. I find when I attend meetings and seminars in New York that there is often little perception of the importance of this relationship. The Security Council proceeds on the basis of the assistance and the expertise of the tribunals as it makes its decisions. The Council interacts with and learns from the tribunals. The adoption of Security Council Resolution 1966 of 2010, establishing this mechanism, was preceded by complex and novel discussions in the Security Council informal working group that lasted for about four years. Throughout the process, my office and the Security Council members learned as much as possible from you, the tribunals, about your essential functions in order to identify those that must continue after the closure of the tribunals. The patience and the persistence that you brought to this exercise is a large part of the reason underlying the Security Council's success in completing its negotiations in 2010, which was essential timing in order to lay out a roadmap for the completion of the work of the tribunals and the transition to this mechanism. The task of my office over the last five years or so in working closely with the Security Council members would have been much more difficult if we had not been able to rely on the professionalism and dedication of the staff of the tribunals in combining with us to design and bring to fruition the institution that today is beginning the task of succeeding the tribunals. I would therefore like to take this opportunity to thank all of you on behalf of myself and the staff of the Office of Legal Affairs for this invaluable support and assistance. As President Marone and the other principals of the mechanism and the tribunals have experienced in New York, the Security Council and its informal working group on criminal tribunals are now every bit as focused on this implementation phase of the mechanism as they were on negotiating the resolution and statute. They are following every aspect of it closely, both administrative and legal. They take their role as the responsible parent of these judicial institutions very seriously. And like all good parents, 
are not slow to offer advice, criticism, and support in equal measures. I am sure, therefore, that you and we will continue to work closely in a successful partnership as we keep the Security Council informed and reassured on the progress here. As I said at the start of my remarks, we are involved here today together in a historic development in international criminal law. This mechanism will form part of the architecture of international criminal justice alongside the International Criminal Court. It will be charged with ensuring that the rights of all concerned, victims, witnesses, and convicted, continue to be respected, and that the important achievements and legacy of the 20 or so years of the tribunal's existence is preserved. Each of us is playing a part in this unique and remarkable transition in the judicial process that has the attention of the entire international community. Your work in ensuring this transition and in continuing to fight impunity for the shocking crimes committed in Rwanda and the former Yugoslavia not only has my personal respect and admiration, but the firm and unwavering support of the Secretary General of the United Nations and its legal counsel. I want to assure each of you, judges, senior officials, and staff, that you will continue to have every support that New York can offer. Your individual and collective efforts have brought the tribunals a very long way. Let us carry on working together in a committed partnership to ensure continued success and to send a powerful signal to deter anyone who may consider committing such crimes in the future. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very, very much, uh, Mr. Assistant Secretary General. We all, uh, let me assure you, have greatly appreciated your words of encouragement and of commitment. Our uh, next speaker will be the Honorable Matthias Chico, the Minister for Constitutional and Legal Affairs. But before I give you the floor, I would like to seize this opportunity to express our enormous gratitude to the government of the United Republic of Tanzania for the gracious hospitality it has shown the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda since its very early days and which has, it has now extended to the mechanism. In particular, I wish to recognize the offer of land from the government for the construction of new premises for the Arusha branch of the mechanism. The mechanism greatly appreciates the cooperation shown by both you and your government and looks forward to a continuation of this warm cooperation in the future. Mr. Minister. Your Excellency, Mr. Stephen Matthias, Assistant Secretary General for Legal Affairs, Honorable Judge Theodore Mehron, President of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and President of the International Residual Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals, Mr. Hassan Jallo, Prosecutor of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda and Prosecutor of the International Residual Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals, <coughs> Honorable Mr. John Hawken, Registrar of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and Registrar of the International Residual Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals. Honorable Judge Van Johansson, President of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. Honorable Mr. Pascal Besnia, Officer in Charge of the Judicial and Legal Services of the ICTR. Honorable Mr. Martin Ngoga, Prosecutor General of the Republic of Rwanda distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I should like, first of all, to express my deep gratitude to you, Honorable Judge Meron, 
president of the International Residual Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals, for inviting me to this occasion. I'm also thankful to the entire international community for making the launching of the IRM possible. Let me, on behalf of the government of the United Republic of Tanzania, convey sincere appreciation to the United Nations for entrusting us once again with the responsibility of hosting the mechanism as well as the ICTR archives. We shall devote all our energy in addressing the many challenges ahead and hope that the international community will partner with us in all these endeavors. Mr. President, as host, I should also assume the role of inviting all those who have traveled all the way to attend this special event. In doing so, there is no better way of saying this than saying it in our own Kiswahili, is Karibu Nisada. I hope you'll find time to test the warmth of Arusha, also known as the little, the Geneva of Africa. Mr. President, today we all stand as a proud people for having accomplished the creation of this mechanism. Let us rejoice together for this achievement as we also assume the new responsibility of enhancing its work. As you all know, the launching of the mechanism marks the conclusion of the mandate of the ICTR. As a host country, it is quite appropriate to appreciate the role played by the ICTR since its inception. But in the interest of time, it suffices to say that the ICTR has left as legacy in the development of international law in the region as well as in the world at large. This is the legacy of which we have cause to celebrate today. Indeed, the tribunal has not only enriched the criminal law practice in the region, but it has also added value to the international criminal judicial practice and jurisprudence as a whole. In the main, throughout its existence, volumes of seminal works have been written enriching theory and practice of law. Equally important, the ICTR has served as a research, learning, and educational hub for universities, colleges, high schools, local and international courts in the area of international criminal law. Consequently, many professors and students have spent time with the tribunal doing research and internship. By and large, its presence in Arusha has amplified the recognition of Tanzania and the vivid memories of the late Malim Julius Kambarage Nyerere for his tireless efforts in the quest for peace and reconciliation in Africa in general and in the Great Lakes area in particular. At this juncture, I should hasten to express my sincere appreciation of the government of Tanz uh, Native Republic of Tanzania for employment opportunities that were offered to my fellow Tanzanians at the tribunal. I believe that the kind of exposure and knowledge that they have acquired will help them in the search for similar opportunities elsewhere, possibly within the IRM, including within our own government. Mr. President, as I intimated earlier on, the government of the Natural Republic of Tanzania is very much thankful to the international community for the trust and confidence upon it by locating the mechanism in Arusha. We remain ready and willing to assume this noble obligation as a host country. For it goes without saying that every opportunity is, by and large, an obligation, and indeed, a possession, every possession a duty. To this end, in the coming days and months, we'll be following up closely uh, all pending issues pertaining to the construction of the IRM building at the area allocated to it with the urgency it deserves. The fact that His, ex ex His Excellency President Jakaya Mrisho Kikwete has always been keen and dedicated to the work of the ICTR, and now the, I the IRM is quite reassuring. I am glad to inform you that even as I speak to you here today, senior government officials from all key ministries are meeting under the chairmanship of the Chief Secretary, Ambassador Mbeni Sefue, to chart out the best ways to fast track the legal and other administrative processes pertaining to the land allocated to the IRM. 
Ambassador Sefu has served as permanent representative of Tanzania to the United Nations office in New York before his appointment as Chief Secretary. He therefore had opportunity to follow up the whole process of creating the mechanism and the subsequent selection of Af Arusha as a seat for the mechanism. It is not an exaggeration that is keen and dedicated to the work of the IRM. I'm quite certain that will be posted with the outcome of this important meeting, which is going on right now. In closing, let me assure you, Mr. President, that the government of the United Republic of Tanzania as a host country attaches great importance to the work of the IRM and considers its existence as paramount. Let me also reiterate our total and full commitment in facilitating your work. We will make our best efforts to do whatever it takes to enable the mechanism to perform its functions the same way as we have done with the ICTR. I have the firm conviction that we can do it, and together we will do it. I thank you so much, Mr. President. Thank you, Excellency. Minister Chikawe, I can assure you that we are all very heartened indeed by your uh, commitment and support and the promise to continue that uh, kind of and level of support in the future. And we greatly appreciate your words. Now, uh, I have the pleasure to welcome the Honorable Mr. Martin Goga, who is the Prosecutor General of the Republic of Rwanda and who will represent this morning here today uh, the Republic of Rwanda. Uh, Mr. Ngoga, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Stephen, uh, Your Lordship Justice Meron, President of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, and the President of the Mechanism of International Criminal Tribunals, Honorable Minister Matthias Chikawe, Minister of Constitution and Legal Affairs of the United Republic of Tanzania, Your Lordship Judge Van, the President of the ICTR, Mr. Justice Hassan Jalo, the Prosecutor of the ICTR and Prosecutor of the Mechanism of International Criminal Tribunals, Mr. Hawking, the Registrar of the ICTY and the re Registrar of the mechanism. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for this opportunity for me to be here and grace this very important occasion and allow me to convey apologies, sincere apologies from other senior government officials who are invited here but could not make it because this event co coincides with other important commitments. But they congratulate you for this day and asked me to convey their sincere apologies. And for me personally, uh, I'm very grateful because I was blessed with an opportunity to work with the ICTR for many years. I, uh, my professional life has mainly been with the ICTR from its inception to date. So I have a, an emotional attachment to this institution and I'm grateful for being here today. Rwanda is grateful to, to what the ICTR has done to us. And we appreciate very well, we understand very well the achievements of the ICTR that has been able to bring to justice high level perpetrators of genocide who could have otherwise easily eluded justice because they were already out of reach of our national system and it was highly unlikely that you could get them. So we appreciate the role the ICR played that was far beyond the capacities of national systems. We understand your contribution to the tools that the international community needs to tackle impunity in terms of the way you have enriched the international law the way you have enriched the jurisprudence that we will continue to need in the future to tackle impunity collectively as the community of mankind. We also understand that the decisions the ICTR took in different cases 
were far beyond mere decisions in individual cases. Every single decision carried a heavier value of deterrence, and this message has been heard across the world. Uh, the decisions you took in cases, the judgments, the judicial notes were not just decisions on convenience of trials, but decisions that were meant to provide a deterrence and to keep the records on genocide and the truth about the genocide intact for many years to come. Uh, of course, it has been said uh, quite often that Rwanda has been critical of the court, uh, but I think we need to understand the, the context. Uh, the court was created by the international community and everybody in the international community had a stake in it. But Rwanda had a special position. It's, it, it was created because there had happened the genocide in Rwanda. So we were possibly one single country that was so keen to observe what was happening here. We were more observant than anybody else. We were more interested than anybody else. So we were very likely to uncover weaknesses more than anybody else. And where we appeared to criticize, it was in the spirit of partnership, it was in good faith, it was meant to keep the tribunal within track, it was never meant to, to discredit the work of the court or to put it in disrepute. We acted in good faith and we hope we helped through our attitude to shape the work of the tribunal and we are proud of our role. Uh, about the mechanism, we, we welcome the appointment of, of, of Justice Meron, uh, Mr. Hawking, Ms. Justice Jaro, uh, to, to lead or to manage the mechanism. We immediately after your appointments, we stated on record that we were happy that the mechanism was going to be in the hands of people who already know these institutions. So there is going to be continuity. And we pledge our support. We will continue to support the work of the mechanism the way we supported the work of the ICTR. And our understanding of some issues that need uh, more discussion and frank discussion, we hope you will avail yourselves for these discussions that are going to be very relevant to, to, to shape our relationship in the future. But in general terms, we can register our uh, support to the work of the mechanism. I wanted to seize this opportunity to thank the, the staff of the ICTR, those present and those who are not present, for the contributions you made uh, to, to, to the success of this court. You, you, you dedicated a big part of your professional life to associate with this noble cause. So individually and collectively, we very much appreciate your, your role, and we thank you for that. And we also thank the government of Tanzania that played host to this court. Uh, Tanzania has been a very good neighbor who did not only emerge to support and host the court, but even before then, Tanzania had hosted negotiations that were aimed at resolving the conflict that was going on in Rwanda. So we thank you very much, and we hope you will continue to support the work of the mechanism the way you supported the work of the ICTR. With these few remarks, I uh, wanted to once more uh, register the appreciation of the government of Rwanda on the work of the ICTR, and to register again the unwavering support that we shall continue to extend to the mechanism. And the attitude won't change. It will be one of frank discussion, one of constructive criticism, and one that does not uh, walk the talk. And we hope you will uh, also be supportive in this ambition that we have as a country uh, so that we continue to act together in unison. We continue to maintain our unit of purpose and we continue to work together so that we can achieve the objectives. We, we are closing one chapter, but we are opening yet another page but together, I'm very confident that with the support of everybody, we will achieve the objectives we, we have been 
uh, task to achieve by the international community. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prosecutor Nigoga, for your statement. And I thank the government yourself and the government of Rwanda for your assurance of continuing support, which we will very badly need in the future, as we needed it in the past. So I'm grateful to you. I will now uh, make my own statement as uh, president of the mechanism. Uh, thank you, first of all, for joining us to mark this commencement <coughs> of the first branch of the mechanism for international criminal tribunals. Today's opening of the mechanism's first branch would simply not have been possible were it not for the tremendous dedication of our colleagues in the Office of Legal Affairs, the principals and staff of the ICTR, the Tanzanian government, and of course, the prosecutor and the registrar of the mechanism itself. I say thank you all very, very much for your tireless efforts to date and for all that you will continue to do to ensure a smooth transition in the days and in the months ahead. The mechanism for international criminal tribunals is of course not the first international judicial institution to commence operations here in Arusha. Nearly two decades ago, following the horrifying waves of violence that swept through Rwanda in 1994, the United Nations Security Council established the ICTR to bring to justice persons responsible for genocide and other serious violations of international humanitarian law and thus to contribute to ensuring that such violations are halted and effectively redressed. The ICTR's founding itself came little more than a year after the creation of the ICTY, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the first truly international criminal tribunal of the modern era and the substantive expression of the international community's aspiration for justice, not retribution or impunity, but justice, should be the response to grave atrocities. While the founding of the ICTY represented a watershed moment, the establishment of the ICTR was no less significant. On its own, the ICTY would have been a brave but isolated experiment. The creation of the ICTR made it resoundingly clear that ending impunity was not a passing interest for the international community, but rather an enduring principle that would lead to sustained, to concrete action. Put differently, if the ICTY opened the door, it was the ICTR that confirmed that the world had entered a new era of accountability. In the years that followed their founding, the ICTR, together with the ICTY, have demonstrated through dozens of trials and appeals that it is possible to bring to justice those accused of terrible crimes, to apply international criminal and humanitarian law in actual cases, and to do so fairly and impartially. Time and again, the trials before the ICTR have shown that no person, however high or powerful, a leader he or she once was, is beyond the reach of justice. And through its patient and methodical consideration of case after case, of courageous witness testimony, reams of evidence, hours of argument, the ICTR has helped to construct a powerful and poignant record of the agonizing horror of the genocide that engulfed Rwanda in 1994. Indeed, 
It is thanks to both the ICTR and the ICTY that the world, in particular those men, women, and children who lived through the almost indescribable tragedies in Rwanda and the former Yugoslavia, has a fuller understanding of what happened there. With an understanding of this history, we are better prepared for the fight to ensure that such atrocities do not happen again. More broadly, it is thanks to both the ICTR and the ICTY and the hundreds of decisions and judgments issued by the tribunals in the last two decades that the contours of international humanitarian law have become far clearer than they once were. There is now no question that rape and other forms of sexual violence may amount to genocide, a principle first articulated by the ICTR in the groundbreaking Akayasu judgment. It is now well established that not just senior military leaders, but civilians and political figures may be held accountable for the actions of their subordinates and that heads of state can and will be brought to justice for serious crimes committed under their authority. And there can no longer be any debate that fundamental humanitarian principles which underlie international humanitarian law as a whole are applicable even when an armed conflict is waged within the borders of a single state. In sum, through their achievements, both inside the courtroom and in myriad other ways, these two pioneering tribunals have served as important models, and together they have laid vital legal, procedural, and institutional groundwork for the other international criminal courts and countless national judicial initiatives that have followed. Indeed, without the success of the tribunals, it is unlikely that a permanent international criminal court would have received the necessary political support to become the reality that it is today. Without a doubt, the establishment of both the ICTR and the ICTY led to a profound change in the landscape of international criminal justice. All that has been achieved by both tribunals due in large measure to the dedication and idealism of their judges and staff. I pay tribute today to all of those staff who have been central to its success and who are continuing to support the mission of the ICTR so faithfully and well. I thank you. It is very fitting that we pause and reflect upon these achievements of these two great tribunals as we celebrate the opening of the mechanism today. And it is particularly appropriate that we recall all that the ICTR and the ICTY have accomplished in light of the challenges they faced at the time of their creation. These two tribunals were called upon to establish comprehensive, functional, and fair judicial systems from the ground up. They were required to build cooperative relationship with states to resolve problems related to gathering of evidence from afar and to develop effective means to protect victims and witnesses. They also had to find ways to ensure adequate legal representation of accused persons and to articulate and apply fair rules of procedure and evidence so as to ensure just proceedings. Today, as the mechanism assumes responsibility for certain key functions of the ICTR, it faces some of the same challenges that the ICTR confronted in its early years, as well as new and special challenges. It is, after all, a new type of an institution, a new experiment 
in international criminal justice. Foremost among the key functions of the ICTR, which is being transferred to the mechanism, is the maintenance of protections granted to victims and witnesses by the ICTR. The judgments of the ICTR would not have been possible without the bravery of the victims and witnesses who gave evidence. These individuals who believed that justice must be done and were courageous enough to come before the tribunal gave evidence against those accused of the most horrendous crimes, often persons who once enjoyed high political standing in their communities. In return, the ICTR undertook to ensure that these victims and witnesses would continue to receive protection from retribution for their testimony. This undertaking is of profound importance, not just for the individuals involved and for their families, but for international criminal justice as a whole and the mechanism will carry out its responsibilities towards protected victims and witnesses without interruption. The mechanism will ensure that adequate support networks are provided to all protected victims and witnesses, and that any person who attempts to interfere with those victims and witnesses will be brought to account. Building upon the important work of the ICTR, the mechanism is also assuming responsibility for the critical task of ensuring that the remaining three ICTR fugitives, whose cases have not been referred to national jurisdictions, are called to account. We cannot afford to let those accused of the most horrific of crimes wait out criminal justice. We cannot afford to let the remaining fugitives or anyone else assume that the passage of time signals indifference or the weakening of the international community's resolve to ensure accountability for the worst of crimes. If impunity is allowed to flourish once more, many of our achievements over the past two decades will be fundamentally undermined. As president of the mechanism, I pledge to do my utmost to ensure, together with Prosecutor Jallo, state cooperation in the arrest and trial of outstanding fugitives. The mechanism must and will work with states to ensure that individuals who have been indicted by the ICTR but not yet arrested will be brought to justice. When, not if, but when this occurs, the mechanism stands ready to try these remaining cases in accordance with the terms of its statute. It likewise is prepared to hear any appeals from judgments or sentences issued by the ICTR that fall within the mechanism's competence, as well as any requests for review of judgment as mandated by the UN Security Council. And it is now the responsibility of the mechanism, and specifically of its president, to supervise the enforcement of sentences imposed by the ICTR and to decide on requests for pardon or commutation of sentence, including from convicted persons already serving sentences. Importantly, in conducting these proceedings, as well as all the other matters that come before the mechanism, the mechanism will act in accordance with the statute and the rules of procedure and evidence that hew closely to those of the ICTR. Such normative continuity is not simply a matter of convenience or efficiency. It is rather in service to the principles of due process and fundamental fairness principles that have been at the core of the judicial work of both the ICTR and the ICTY for nearly two decades and will be central to the judicial work of the mechanism for years to come. Of course, 
as we are all too aware, the ICTR was never intended or equipped to try the cases of all persons accused of the commission of horrendous crimes during the Rwandan genocide. The mechanism will ensure that the valuable assistance to national jurisdictions long supplied by the ICTR continues unabated by, among other things, granting access to evidence and providing assistance with the tracking of fugitives whose cases have been referred to national authorities. Similarly, those cases that the ICTR has referred to national judiciaries will not be forgotten by the mechanism. As it commences its operations, the mechanism takes over the competence of the ICTR to monitor the progress of those cases and assumes the important responsibility of ensuring their fair and impartial adjudication. In this respect, I note the recent referrals of eight cases by the ICTR to Rwanda, and in particular, the great strides that have been taken by the Rwandan authorities in amending their legislation to ensure the competence of Rwandan courts to hear these cases in, the, in accordance with the highest standards of international due process. The cases of the ICTR <coughs> have left an undeniable and indelible impact on international law. <coughs> but the essential building blocks upon which the ICTR trials were based, the documentary and testimonial evidence at the foundation of every case, and the judgments and decisions issued at trial and on appeal make an equally important contribution to the historic record. The fact that the Security Council envisaged the preservation and management of the ICTR's archives as one of the essential functions that should pass to the mechanism and should continue even after the ICTR closes its doors only serves to underscore this importance. Before concluding my remarks, it is my pleasure to announce that later today, I will be signing the very first order of the residual mechanism, one naming my colleague, Judge Van Jensen, as a duty judge of the residual mechanism. As I conclude my remarks, As I conclude my remarks, let me emphasize that in gathering here today, we are not, we are not mourning the replacement of one institution by another. The ICTR will continue to carry out its mandate in accordance with both its statute and the terms of Security Council Resolution 1966, and the mechanism will work alongside it benefiting and learning from the tremendous efforts and experience of the judges and staff who continue to devote themselves so selflessly to the mission of the ICTR. Instead, today is about renewal. Today we mark the renewal of the international community's commitment to the fundamental and unwavering principle that impunity for the worst of crimes may never be allowed to reign. We mark the renewal of the international community's commitment and the commitment of both the ICTY and the ICTR to ensuring that national jurisdictions, which are ready and able to investigate and prosecute serious crimes, receive the assistance needed to do so. We mark the renewal of the commitment undertaken by the ICTR to protect those victims and witnesses who gave evidence in its proceedings. We mark the renewal of our commitment that those individuals who stand accused or who have been convicted will be treated in accordance with the highest standards of procedure and substantive fairness. 
and we mark the renewal of our collective commitment to ensure that the evidence, testimonies, and other materials gathered by the ICTR, a valuable part of the history of the Rwandan genocide, will remain available and accessible for the people of Rwanda and of the world and for generations to come so that they may never forget why it was that the ICTR was created and so that we may learn from our past and ensure that atroc atrocities like those that occurred in Rwanda in 1994 never happen again. And I thank you. I now would like uh, to recognize uh, Mr. Hassan Bubakar Jallo, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda and the mechanism for International Criminal Tribunal. Prosecutor Jallo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Presidents, Honorable Presidents of the ICTR, the ICTY, and the Residual Mechanism, the Honorable Minister of Justice of the Republic of Tanzania, my colleague, the Prosecutor General of the Republic of Rwanda, the registrars of the ICTR and the ICTY, and also of the mechanism, Your Excellencies, members of the Diplomatic Corps, distinguished guests. Today marks the beginning of a new journey for international criminal justice as we launch the mechanism for criminal tribunals and the commencement of the ICTR branch of that mechanism. As we know, the mechanism was established by the UN Security Council as a means of ensuring that important functions that will outlive the closure of the ad hoc tribunals are effectively attended to, and that those who played a leading role in committing genocide and other serious violations of international humanitarian law do not escape accountability simply because of the closure of these ad hoc tribunals. I am happy to report today that the Office of the Prosecutor of the Mechanism is ready today to commence this important work for which the mechanism was established. A fair number of the staff of the OTP has been recruited and are already on board, and these include our investigators who also specialize in tracking fugitives, crime analysts, and language assistants. The recruitment of the legal officers documents control assistants and other administrative officers of the OTP are also actively underway. The rest of the staff of the OTP is expected to be on board within the next months when the office will operate at full strength. This staff complement that is on board will enable the OTP to start tracking as of today, indeed to continue the work of the ICTR in tracking the most immediate challenge facing the, the, the mechanism, namely the tracking and arrest of the top three fugitives, Kabuga, Mpiranya, and Bizimana, who have been earmarked for trial by the mechanism. In creating the mechanism, the Security Council called on all member states to cooperate in the arrest and prosecution of the three accused for their roles in the Rwandan genocide of 1994. I would like to reiterate that call and underline the fact that the efforts of international criminal justice will be seriously undermined unless these leaders of the genocide are arrested and called to account for their deeds. The transition from ad hoc tribunals to the mechanism does not entail any dilution of state obligations in this respect. All states are and remain legally obliged to cooperate with the mechanism, particularly with regard to the arrest and transfer for trial of the remaining fugitives, three of them to the mechanism, and the rest to the national jurisdictions to which their cases have been transferred by the ICTR. In addition, our office will focus on servicing foreign re requests from foreign governments for assistance in the national investigations and prosecution of these international crimes. This activity has become an increasingly important function, given the very serious and productive partnership between national and international legal systems in combating impunity. 
archives and records management will also be an important component of our mandate. The OTP of the ICTR is now in a position to transfer the records of 27 of our completed cases, which I'm advised is equivalent to 185 linear meters to the mechanisms registrar. These records have been cleaned, freed from corrosive materials, rehoused, labeled, and boxed. A substantial amount of them have already been digitized, and the OTP will continue to prepare the remaining records for handover to the mechanism archives. Thus, tracking of fugitives for trial, the servicing of funded requests for assistance, and the preparation of archives for the mechanism will be the principal concerns of the OTP of the mechanism in the months ahead. As the mechanism was envisaged to be a small entity with limited duties of a residual nature, the expectation has been that the ICTR and the ICTY would do their utmost to complete most of their workload in order to ensure a minimal load for the mechanism. It is gratifying to note that all the organs, that the OTP and indeed all the organs of the ICTR have, have through their work and through their dedication to the mandate ensured that the OTP of the mechanism inherits a relatively light workload. All the genocide trials have been done and completed except for one which is pending judgment. As already indicated, the OTP will have only five, three fugitives to track although we remain aware of the immense challenges in the tracking of particularly those three, I expect that the OTP of the RM will also deal with one appeal that is expected to arise in, in a particular case and to deal with requests for foreign assistance. The OTP of the ICTR's work and the conclusion of its work on the Rule 71 bis Evidence Preservation Proceedings will facilitate any trials at the RM for the three remaining fugitives. The OTP has also secured the referrals to national jurisdictions of all the cases which had been earmarked for such transfer under the ICTR completion strategy. All this combined combines to ensure that as envisaged by its architects, the residual mechanism will start off with a light workload. Let me conclude by recognizing the important contribution of the various agencies and individuals who have worked tirelessly behind the scenes to make this happen. I wish to recognize in this regard the important contribution of the UN Security Council's Working Group on International Tribunals, the UN Office of Legal Affairs represented by the Assistant Secretary General, Mr. Matthias, as well as other departments of the United Nations. I would like to thank the governments and the peoples of the United Republic of Tanzania and also of Rwanda for their cooperation with the ICTR over the years, which has contributed significantly to the many accomplishments of the completion strategy and thus laid the groundwork for the launch today of the residual mechanism. I look forward now as prosecutor of the, of the mechanism to continuing this fruitful relationship of cooperation with both countries. Finally, my appreciation to all the principals of the ad hoc tribunals and the mechanism, their presidents, their prosecutors and the registrars and their staff who have worked together so hard to ensure the timely commencement of this branch of the mechanism today as envisaged by the United Nations Security Council. I thank you for your attention. <clears throat> thank you, Prosecutor Jarlow. Next, I would like to call on uh, Judge Van Johnson, the President of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. Thank you, President Meron. Minister Chikwabwe, Prosecutor General Ngoga, Mr. President, Mr. Prosecutor, Mr. Assistant Secretary General for Legal Affairs, Mr. Registrar, Mr. Deputy Registrar, Honorable Judges, Excellences, Distinguished Guests. It is my distinct honor to be part of this event, which marks an important milestone in international criminal justice. 
First, I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate President Meron, Prosecutor Diallo, and Registrar Hawking for their successful efforts to establish this Arusha branch of the mechanism in short time and under tight budgetary constraints. Today, with the official opening of the mechanism, the ICTR passes the torch with respect to most of the tribunal's judicial and prosecutorial activities, and I could not be more confident of the hands in which we place these responsibilities. I applaud the exceptional efforts put forth by the judges, staff, and interns of the tribunal, without which we would not have been able to reach this moment. In the five years I've served as a judge of the ICTR, I've had the great pleasure of working with some of the world's most dedicated and capable legal minds who have worked interminably to ensure that all trial and appellate proceedings are executed in a fair and expeditious manner. In recent years, the ever-shrinking group of remaining judges and legal officers have gone far beyond the call of duty to complete their work and help prepare the tribunal for this day. The ICTR and ICTY have laid a, a strong foundation for international peace and justice. The jurisprudence of the tribunals has provided a strong precedent buttressing internationally recognized standards of human rights and codifying international criminal law to ensure that these standards are enforced. Together, the ICTR, ICTY, and the mechanism must continue to work to ensure that the legacy of challenging impunity that has been the cornerstone of the tribunals does not fade. The information and documentation centers, outreach programs, and witness and victim support programs for the tribunal will now become the responsibility of the mechanism. Through these programs built to preserve history and educate future generations, I'm very confident that the mechanism will continue to work, will continue the work of the ICTR to ensure that never again will such atrocities occur. The establishment of the mechanism allows the two pioneering tribunals to close without fear that impunity will pervade. The rights of victims, witnesses, accused referred to national jurisdictions, and those tried by the tribunal, whether acquitted or convicted, will continue to be respected. The Arusha branch of the mechanism also serves as an appropriate location for the storage of the unparalleled body of jurisprudence and historical records accrued by this tribunal. In short, the successful establishment of the mechanism ensures that these somber proceedings will not be forgotten. On behalf of the ICTR, I thank all of you for your invaluable contributions to making this day a success. It continues to be a great honor to serve justice with you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, President Johnson. Thank you, first duty judge of the mechanism starting today. Uh, our next it, it, speaker is... Uh, yeah, um, may I say, it, it was not in my speech, so I will add it here. I, I thank for the honor of being appointed to the judge. Thank you. <clears throat> Our uh, next speaker is uh, Monsieur Pascal Besnier, uh, who will be speaking on behalf of the registrar of the ICTR, Mr. Dieng, who inevitably could not be with us today, and I'm grateful to you for uh, joining us today, Monsieur Besnier. Thank you. Mr. Assistant Secretary General Matthias, Mr. Uh, Minister Chikawe, Mr. Prosecutor General Ngoga, Mr. President, Honorable Judges, Mr. Prosecutor, uh, Mr. Registrar and colleagues. Uh, the Registrar Adam Adyeng was indeed unable to attend today's meeting and ceremony and he asked me to present a few comments on his behalf. Uh, however, in respect of the Francophone community, I uh, present today in honor of the French Ambassador Escure and uh, the Francophone judges, I will present my remarks in French. 
it will be <laughs> so short and so simple that everybody will understand, even without the headsets. Um, Le greffier et son équipe se sont euh, employés inlassablement depuis le 23 décembre 2010 à assurer la transition vers le mécanisme judiciaire. L'ensemble du personnel du greffe a travaillé double pendant ces années euh, pour mettre en place les fondations de ce qui n'est pas une continuation du TPIR, mais une toute nouvelle juridiction. Qu'ils en soient ici remerciés, qu'ils soient tous remerciés, les chefs de section, mais aussi euh, les employés, euh, les procureurs, les agents de sécurité, tous ceux qui ont travaillé double pour que ce mécanisme résiduel aujourd'hui voit le jour. Merci au nom du greffier et merci chaleureusement. Euh, je crois que le greffier aurait déclaré aujourd'hui que le mécanisme judiciaire, sa naissance, n'est pas une bonne nouvelle. Le mécanisme judiciaire est une très mauvaise nouvelle pour les accusés qui sont aujourd'hui encore en fuite. S'il tablait sur le fait que la communauté internationale allait se lasser ou serait fatiguée de les poursuivre, ils se sont trompés. La communauté internationale est toujours sur leurs traces. Le président, le procureur a cité leur nom tout à l'heure et si je pouvais m'adresser à eux, je leur dirais rendez-vous. Rendez-vous et vous bénéficierez d'un procès équitable. Rendez-vous parce que vous vieillissez et que chaque année passée en fuite compte double. Rendez-vous parce que vous tomberez malade et vous n'aurez pas accès aux soins médicaux auxquels vous auriez accès si vous vous étiez rendu. Rendez-vous parce que un jour vous décéderez et que votre tombe restera anonyme. Devant le mécanisme judiciaire, vous bénéficierez d'un procès équitable. Vous bénéficierez même de la meilleure défense possible, si j'en crois, la qualité et le courage des avocats de la défense devant le TPIR. Comme l'a dit euh, M. Mathias tout à l'heure, qui aurait pu croire que le tribunal international pour le Rwanda allait durer aussi longtemps Qui aurait pu croire que 16 années se sont écoulées depuis le commencement du TPIR. Par coïncidence, je me trouvais moi-même présent ici, euh, à côté de cette salle, dans une salle d'audience, en 1996, quand le tribunal a commencé ses travaux. Et nous voilà ici, devant le mécanisme judiciaire, le mécanisme un peu plus vieux, sans doute, un peu plus chargé d'expérience et de sagesse, je l'espère, et nous étions enthousiastes à cette époque. Nous savions qu'il y avait d'importantes attentes devant le TPIR et ces attentes ont été remplies. Nous pensons que les attentes sont tout aussi importantes et tout aussi sérieuses devant le mécanisme judiciaire. Je pense à la coopération internationale, je pense à l'exécution des sentences et sa supervision, et je pense aussi au traitement des archives. Ce sont des années de travail qui attendent le mécanisme judiciaire, son président, son procureur et son greffier. Et je leur souhaite bonne chance. Et selon la tradition française, je lève mon verre au mécanisme judiciaire. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, monsieur. Euh, monsieur euh nous vous sommes extrêmement reconnaissants, pas seulement pour euh, vos remarques aujourd'hui, mais surtout pour votre travail extraordinaire qui, que vous avez fait avec vos collègues, avec M. Deng et tous, les, tous vos collègues, tous vos collaborateurs ici. Et c'est grâce à vous que nous sommes prêts aujourd'hui, malgré toutes les difficultés que nous avions de commencer notre travail euh, à la date prévue qui était prévu par le Conseil de sécurité. Et c'est pour ça que vous, nous vous sommes extrêmement reconnaissants. Our next and last speaker is Mr. John Hawking, the registrar of the ICTY and the registrar of the RM and uh, 
Before I give you the floor, Mr. Hawking, let me tell you that all of us are enormously grateful to you for the truly exceptional work that you have done during the last uh, few weeks. You had only about three months, uh, more or less, to prepare this institution, and you had to start completely from the scratch. Uh, the fact that we are actually not only starting today, which probably we would have even if we were not ready, but we are starting in a state in which we have offices and o operating uh, computers and a core of a staff and indeed we are in a position today to issue our first orders would not have happened were it not for your extraordinary commitment <laughs> Hawking. thank you very very much um, president meron for your your very kind words and i pass on the thanks that you've directed to me to um, all of those staff of the ICTR and the ICTY who've worked with me. Thank you, President Aaron. During the genocide, they poured petrol on me and set me on fire. They whipped me three times on my back. They pierced my chest with a spear. On the same day, we were 50,000 in that parish. I saw my entire family getting killed. I ran away. When they found me, I begged the Interahamwe to kill me on the spot. They refused because they said it would have been too much work to carry my dead body to the mass grave. I did not know what else was waiting for me, but I knew that the worst had yet to come. A few hours later, Many men raped me for five consecutive days and nights. I was shattered. I was dead. I was 12. Celeste is no longer 12. I met her in a cafe in early February the weakened figure and dappled skin hardly disguise the scars of the machetes, the burns of the gasoline, and the virus of HIV AIDS that she lives with almost 20 years later. But her piercing look and dignified presence leave no hesitation as to her strength. During the early years of the ICTR, as an entire country was struggling to heal the fresh wounds of the genocide, Celeste boarded a small plane to come to Arusha to testify. Courageously, she relived, act by act, the violence she suffered while facing those whom she considered to be responsible. She shed tears as the defense questioned her rapes. Her act of courage was not in vain. As recently as 20 years ago, ill-willed leaders could still safely indulge in the temptation to abuse power. Today, we know that the truth of a girl from a small village in the heart of Africa can resonate across the globe and ultimately bring down the mighty. That, to me, is the essence of international criminal justice. On this day, on which the work of the ICTR and ICTY converge into an unprecedented institution that further develops international criminal justice, I must give thanks. I must give thanks to the almost 3,000 witnesses who, like Celeste, testified about the atrocities that occurred in Rwanda. The 5,000 witnesses 
who gave evidence of the waves of violence that engulfed the Balkans. I value the, I value the compassion of the witness support assistants who held their witnesses' hands and offered words of support and comfort during those long hours before their testimony. I'm grateful to the interpreters and the translators. They understand. And by understanding and reproducing the suffering of the witnesses, they suffer with them. I commend the dogged determination of investigators and who go tirelessly from village to village to gather pieces of information that the attorneys then zealously puzzle together to build their cases. I recognize and praise the work of the Defense Council, too often, too quickly stigmatized for defending the indefensible, when in fact they defend people's rights, and in doing so, they defend the concept of justice. My profound respect goes to the judges and their staff, passionately working long hours to dissect every piece of information, but dispassionately, fairly, and impartially adjudicating crimes that shock the world's conscience. The toil of the tribunals is not, and must not be, just a momentous achievement obtained through the labor of their hundreds of staff. It is in the hands of the archivists to ensure that this endeavor is preserved and equally importantly made accessible to the world so that the Tindi Gesubire written at every genocide memorial in Rwanda or the Dasana Ponovi, Dasana Zaboravi cried out by the mothers of Srebrenica is not a void never again but continues to be a moral imperative that guides our actions and our beliefs. It would be remiss of me not to acknowledge the prescience and maturity of the member states of the United Nations, without which this fight against impunity would never have begun and justice would not have been done. Whether amending their domestic legislation or bearing the financial burden, whether providing land and hospitality or accepting to enforce the sentences of tribunals or ensuring the seamless flow of witnesses and their protection, I must express gratitude. But the cooperation that justice demands is not over. Nine of those accused of being most responsible for the Rwandan genocide still remain at large. Only one year ago, the last of the 161 ICTY accused was arrested. This proved to us all that the end of impunity is within reach and can be attained. Less than two weeks ago, Rwanda celebrated the completion of their daunting work of the Gachacha courts. In the words of President Kagame, the Gachacha challenged every Rwandan into introspection and soul searching that resulted in truth-telling, national healing, reconciliation and justice. As the ICTR and ICTY are clearing their dockets, may the commencement of the mechanism bring about the arrest of the fugitives and with that, the closure of the most painful chapter of Rwandan history so that those who have suffered the most, like Celeste, may take some comfort from our work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Registrar Hawking, for your very moving uh, statement. Uh, on behalf of the mechanism, I would like to thank you for attending today's ceremony, which now comes to its conclusion. Thank you very much.